the angel will sound, the shout of his coming, and the sleeping shall rise from their slumbering place, and those remaining shall be changed in a moment, and we shall behold him face to face. Well, we welcome you this Lord's Day morning out to our drive-in service, the Open Bible Baptist Church. We trust the Lord will bless you as we gather together and worship today. We're so glad to have each one of you here this morning worshiping with us. We are uh, we're moving through the month of September, and uh, we have a number of students here today, and we've been praying for you as you've returned to classes and, and some university and college students here today as well. And so we trust the Lord will bless you and help you in your studies, and we're glad you're here today. I'm just going to go over the announcements for the remainder of this week. We have on our Wednesday evening is our prayer and Bible time at 7 o'clock at the Milton Community Hall. And then next Lord's Day, we will have Sunday school for the children from 10 to 10.30 up at the Milton Hall and meet here at 11 o'clock for the drive-in service. Be in prayer for those that are in our prayer request section of the bulletin. And if you've not received a bulletin and you would like one, uh, just let us know. We can forward one over to you. And we've asked for prayer for Sharon's daughter, Charity, who uh, needs a biopsy. And um, please keep her in prayer. She also needs a liver surgery. And so if you would remember Charity in prayer. And we know that there are many other health needs that are in our congregation. And we just thank the Lord for his strength each and every day. We need the Lord's help and we need his presence with us and his guidance and strengthening hand to help us through these days. Well, I have a note on the bottom of my bulletin that says there is an anniversary coming this week. And uh, Carl and June are celebrating on the 16th. So happy anniversary, Carl and June. <laughs> Maybe that's what it sounded like on your wedding day, all the horns beeping. <laughs> and Delbert's birthday is coming up on the 20th, so happy birthday, Delbert. <laughs> so may the Lord bless you all, and, and we're so thankful for you, and uh, glad to celebrate with you. Hymn number 52 in our songbooks as we turn to our opening hymn, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Hymn number 52. Let's sing out this morning as unto the Lord. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. An atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. <laughs> Jesus the Son, a purer and 
higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord. said amen. amen praise the lord great things he hath done and great things he is doing and great things that he will do and we give him all the glory today we're going to invite carl come and lead us in our opening prayer now let's pray heavenly father we thank you dear lord for your love and goodness to us dear lord we thank you for that wonderful gift of salvation dear lord that we know, dear Lord, that you've provided for the whole world, every man, woman, and child. We ask, dear Lord, to be many amongst us today, dear Lord, who have never accepted you as their personal Savior, dear Lord. And today will be the day where they will accept that wonderful gift, dear Lord, and have a certainty of eternity with you. Now, dear Lord, as we have this service, dear Lord, we just ask you to be with our pastor. Be with each of us, dear Lord, as we hear what you have for us, dear Lord. We take each a piece, dear Lord, of, of the message today, dear Lord. Let it change us. Let us get closer to you, dear Lord. We just ask, dear Lord, you continue to watch over and guide in each of our lives, dear Lord. Continue to use us and keep us faithful. In this we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hymn number 163. Hymn number 163 is the hymn, My Redeemer, I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story, how my lost estate to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, his triumphant power I'll tell. How the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross, he sealed 
my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. My lips greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, which thou hast redeemed, Psalm 71, verse 23. And we have much to rejoice the Lord in. We think of our redemption and our, our salvation. We think of his presence with us every day. We think of how he's guiding us and leading us. We can be thankful for even this outdoor service that we can meet in this way uh, during these days in which we're living. We have much to be thankful for our precious Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have Carl come for our scripture reading this morning. We'll take our Bibles and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 8. We'll be reading 10 through 21 this morning. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came to the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them and entered into the ship again, departed to the other side. And the disciples had fought, forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of the Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes to see ye not. Having eyes see ye not. And having ears hear ye not. And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They saith unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Carl. Jacob's well was at a place, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour, and he cometh to a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away off to the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee drink living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither can come hither to draw. And I'd like to share a hymn this morning that speaks of that glorious truth of the water. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never
never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. So, my friend, if the things this world gave you Leave hungers that won't pass away. My blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to Him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. You can be thankful that the Lord sustains us he not only fills us but he sustains us each and every day fill my cup lord and certainly what the woman received that day at the well was more than just some water out of the well but she received everlasting life and her life was changed and she went on her way rejoicing telling others that she had met the messiah she had met the christ we're going to invite the ushers to come at this time to take up our morning offering and as we do if you would like to Give this morning, just indicate by your four-way flashers. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you today for the privilege of meeting in this way. We thank you, Father, for our wonderful salvation in Christ. We thank you for the, for the everlasting life we have. We pray, Father, that each one here today knows you're saved. We pray, Father, today that each heart would be encouraged. We pray and we ask as your word goes forward that you would challenge us. But Lord, as we come to the time of giving, we pray you bless each gift and giver. We thank you for your work. We thank you for the gospel that's going around the world. We thank you that we can be a, have a part in what you're doing. And we just give thee thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Carl and Delder for receiving the offering today. And thank you, Katie, for that lovely number. We're going to sing one more number before our message this morning. And it's hymn number 355. This is the hymn, Oh, Happy Day, Happy Day, When Jesus Washed My Sins Away. And it was a glorious, happy day. I remember when the day I received Jesus as my Savior, I shared that with you last week, and I knew that there was a great change that happened. The guilt was gone, the burden was lifted, and I went on my way rejoicing. And so it is with each one of us that come to Christ. There is gladness and there is joy in being a Christian. We're going to sing this one out before the message this morning. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Down together in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the joy it is to be in this place today, the joy it is to sing hymns of praise unto thee, 
The joy it is to know that our sins are forgiven because Jesus has washed us. The joy it is to know that Jesus is risen and he's ascended into glory and he's coming again. The joy it is to know that you walk with us each and every day, that you help us, you guide us, you strengthen us. The joy of having the Holy Spirit of God inside of us as Christians. We pray this morning, Father, that you would take your word and sink it into each one of our hearts here this morning by your spirit. We pray, Father, for salvation if that is needed, that that soul would come to Christ. If it's a need of encouragement, Lord, that you'd help. If it's a need of comfort, Lord, that you would come alongside. Father, if it's a need to challenge us in areas of sin in our lives, Father, that you would convict us. And that by your power and strength, as we confess our sins, we thank, thank you, Lord, that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we just, we rejoice in what you're doing. And so we pray, Father, you would uh, take this time and use it for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask. Amen. We've been studying through a series of messages entitled, living with purpose, living with purpose. And I would like to invite you to take your Bibles with me and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And we're going to turn together to John's Gospel, chapter 14. And I'd like to read three verses with you. The first three verses, Jesus says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We were looking and have been looking at the great purpose of the coming of the Lord Jesus. We found that our Bibles taught us that Jesus came into the world to reveal to us who God is. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We found that the great purpose of the Lord Jesus' coming, of course, was to go to the cross. And on the cross, he bore the sins of the whole world on himself. And we know that he died. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He rose bodily from the grave, conquering even death itself. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then last week we looked at the ascension of Christ. The, the purpose of the ascension of Christ. And four great reasons why Jesus ascended into glory. We're, we were reminded that Jesus ascended unto glory to become the head of the church. He is, he is our leader. He is our head. And he is the preeminent one. He ascended into glory to uh, bring the Holy Spirit, to send the Holy Spirit of God, that he wouldn't just be with us, but that he would be in us. And we have the spirit of the living God indwelling the church today, each and every born again child of God. We know that Jesus ascended into heaven to be our great and our heavenly high priest. And so we have access unto God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we've concluded our message last week with the truth that Jesus ascended into heaven, as it tells us in John chapter 14 here, that he is going to prepare a place for us. He said, if I go, uh, and I go to prepare a place for you. And that place that is preparing is, is glorious. But I would like to notice with you this morning, as we talk about living with purpose, and the uh, we think about the certainty of this life, and a lot of the, in, in this life is very uncertain. We do not know uh, what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what kind of challenges we're going to face in the run of a week, or what kind of phone call we're going to receive. And life can turn upside down very quickly for us at times. Our plans, what we thought were our plans, 
Sometimes they don't even come to pass because of difficulty that arises. But one thing is for certain in all of the uncertainty that we face in the world today, and that is what Jesus said in the third verse of John chapter 14. He said, and uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus said, I will come again. And notice Jesus gives absolute certainty to his disciples that he might not just maybe come back, but that exactly he would return. And you know, 2,000 years have come and gone. We've been thinking of so much time has passed since Jesus spoke these words. But we know that he is preparing a place. And we know that one day he is going to return and he is going to establish a kingdom upon this earth unlike the world has ever seen before. It's going to be a kingdom of righteousness and of power and authority for the Lord Jesus, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will be seated upon the throne of David. Now, the question of centuries or of the centuries has been, when is Jesus going to return and fulfill a very large portion of prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled in the Bible? When is he going to come? In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We don't know just what time it's going to be. Jesus has called us not to be date setters. He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And it's just fascinating to be able to experience some things in this life. And uh, one thing that we experienced recently, we were in a museum. And in this museum, there was a, a picture of the earth. And they had displayed kind of moving in motion on the earth, showing um, arrows and weather patterns, oceanic currents, trying to teach the children. And it's uh, amazing to be reminded how unique Earth is when compared to other planets. We couldn't live like we do on Mars or Jupiter or the moon. Earth is completely different. And we have everything that we need to be able to live and for life to be able to be sustained here in this Earth. And we know that God is the creator of it. He's the sustainer of it. But you know, we uh, get... Every now and then, oftentimes, I'm looking at the forecast. What is the weather going to be like on Sunday? Am I going to need a, or my raincoat? Or, or what's, going to, what the, what's the weather going to be? We get a forecast of uh, what the weather perhaps may be. And oftentimes, we, it's the very opposite of what we see. But that, that happens sometimes, doesn't it? But there, when we think of great storms, like hurricanes, this is hurricane season. And we can be thankful for technology that's able to not only uh, see a storm from a distance, but be able to pinpoint exactly where that storm is in the face of the earth, in what direction that storm is headed, and what speed that storm is headed, and the probability of where that storm will land if it affects land. And how many lives have been spared as a result of a warning that's gone out saying that there was a hurricane or a great storm coming. Jesus told us, we do not know the day or the hour of his return. But he has given to us a forecast, if we could put it that way. He's given to us signs. He says, when you begin to see these signs, know that the time is drawing close. And so I would like you to take your Bibles with me and turn back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. What was he speaking of? What was he referring to? Matthew chapter 24. You know, the disciples asked the Lord Jesus many questions 
A lot of times he would give them parables, an earthly story with a spiritual or a heavenly meaning. Other times he would not give them a, a direct answer, but he would give them, as we find here, signs. In verse number one, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to court to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And you know that got his disciples thinking. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? What a question. They knew who they were talking to. They were talking to the Messiah. They were talking to the Christ. And they asked him, when will it be? What will be the sign of your coming, Lord? What will be the sign which will identify the end of the world of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Jesus gives quite a description of what things will be like on the earth prior to his coming. Jesus told his disciples that there would be a, the end of the age. And that end that Jesus spoke of is not going to come as a result of a global peace program in which there will be a global disarmament and an, a universal love for one another. Jesus spoke of something quite different. Jesus spoke concerning the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows will come when there will be wars when there will be deception, when there'll be rumors of wars, when there will be famines, disease, various earthquakes. And Jesus speaks of these things. And what is happening is we've not only witnessed these things happen, but they're growing in intensity. And we're not left to wonder if prior to the return of Christ, things are going to be peaceful on the earth. For it tells us in verses 10 to 12, Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus said that in the last days it would be like under the days of Noah. When people did that which was... Uh, wicked in their imaginations continually. Jesus says that in the last days and uh, the sign of his coming and prior to his coming, there, there's going to be a, a lack of love. Love will wax cold. Iniquity, sin will abound upon the earth. That natural affection of humanity will be hardened up prior to the coming of the Lord. And so he gives us this warning of what it will be like. Iniquity shall abound. And I'm reminded of the book of Judges. And one key phrase that you'll find in the book of Judges is that phrase that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. 
And that puts me in mind of the day in which we're living. When truth is not absolute anymore, it's considered a relative thing. When we can't take the Bible and, and uh, recognize, well, we certainly can recognize that it's the authority of God's world, but it is certainly rejected largely in the world today. When those who love Jesus are being persecuted. And there are some countries today where they're not able to meet publicly in a place like this. In fact, they're not even legally allowed to have a Bible. They're not legally allowed to share the gospel with a neighbor or a friend or a loved one. They're not legally allowed to tell their children that Jesus loves them. But they do it because they love the Lord. And they know that the gospel has the power to save a soul. And there is great persecution in many places in the world today. The Bible speaks, yes, of a time of tribulation that will take place after the rapture of the church. It will be a time like the world has never experienced before. The Bible says there will be a one world program at that time. The book of the Revelation teaches us that there will be a one world government, that there will be a one world currency, that there will be a one world religion universal and all of these things are laid out in the book of the revelation and we realize that the the uh, beginnings of those things are taking place in the world today but knowing that there are signs happening all over the earth we need to look up for jesus said when these things begin to come to pass look up for your redemption draweth nigh and today we need to look up we need to be watching. We need to be waiting. We need to be anticipating the coming of the Lord. We ask the question, how then can we be ready to meet the Lord? How can we be ready to meet the Lord? Jesus was clear that the end of the age was coming. He was also clear that every soul needs to be saved by the power of the gospel. Romans chapter 10 tells us in verses 9 and 10, he says these words. The Apostle Paul says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God tells us that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and Christ is the only answer for the souls of all of humanity today. And I trust each one of us here today can say, yes, I'm a child of God. There's been a time in my life I've invited Jesus into my heart by faith alone. Because it's by faith is the only means by which we can be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we need to be saved. That's how we can be ready. What are we looking for? We're looking for the rapture of the church, the calling away of the bride of Christ. Yes, the Bible speaks of great, terrible times on the earth that are going to take place after the church is called home. But there are going to be signs of these things, and we see these signs in the world today. I want to challenge Christians, then. I want to challenge us as believers. Yes, it's clear that there are signs pointing to Christ's coming. But you know, there is one today who knows that his days are numbered. It's that one who is the deceiver. His name is Satan. And all his demonic forces, they know that their days are numbered. They know what the Bible teaches, that they'll be cast into the lake of fire someday. And the Bible says that in the last days, Satan will certainly seem to have an advantage over humanity. And I'm afraid that one of the dangers as Christians is that the devil in his program today will affect us. It will hinder our testimony. It will discourage our hearts from living for the Lord. And Christians can be greatly influenced by the devil. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle Paul warns young Timothy and he says to them, says to him this, this know also 
that in the last days perilous times shall come. And what we are given here is a list of, of things which the world will be like, some characteristics of the heart of humanity in the days which will lead to the last time. He calls them perilous days, perilous times. It says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, incontinent, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And he gives Timothy this great warning, a prophetic warning concerning the last days. And the wave of wickedness which is described here in this passage is one that is sweeping our world today. And the, de the devil would love for these sins to sweep through the church and cause as much damage and as much destruction as possible. And the last place a Christian should be hurt is in the church. But sadly today, many Christians have been hurt and some have even turned from the church and God's program for this day in which we're living. And I've often said this, that no church is perfect. No church is perfect because every church is made up of born again sinners saved by the grace of God. No church is perfect, but Jesus is perfect. Our leader, our head, the head of the church is perfect and he's exalted. And we're to follow him. And we're pray, to pray and desire for a Christ-like spirit to be evident in the work of the body of Christ. And so no church is perfect. But yes, every church ought to desire to be led by the spirit of God. And every church ought to be striving for Christ-likeness. Because there's a wave of wickedness. And, the, and it is a growing in intensity in the days in which we're living. It says that there's going to be pleasure lovers of pleasure more than lovers of god and we're living in a world today where certainly there is there is a love for the pleasures of this life and the bible tells us that there's even pleasure in sin but it's for a season and the devil wants to make sin look appealing to the christian and satan wants to cause dissension within the church he wants to cause rifts. He wants to cause hurt feelings. He wants to cause un, un, an unforgiving spirit. And, and just as God has a plan and a program, and Jesus has a pro program for every local church, so too the devil also has a plan. And as the days are approaching, I see and we see in the world today Wickedness growing, iniquity abounding, the uh, love waxing cold. And it says that the, the day in which these perilous times shall come, there will be a form of godliness. A form of godliness. There will be a, a masquerade. It will appear as though it is godly. But he says... There will be no power. There will be no power. And we can go through motions, but we can also be deceived. And I believe one of Satan's agendas in the hour we're living is to get our attention off the central mission of the church and onto something else. He wants to see a church that is without the blessing of God. He wants to see a church that doesn't have the power of Christ abiding in it and through it. And yes, the church can be distracted at times. But what is the central miss mission of the church? Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said 
he came and spake unto them, saying in verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even on to the end of the world. Amen. This, these were Jesus' last words, some of his last words before he ascended into heaven, and they were words given and directed to the, the future mission of the church. There was a call to the gospel. Teach all nations. It's a call of discipleship. Not only seeing people come to Christ, but designed for Christians to be encouraged. And that's the mission of the church today. It's not only is it evangelism, the gospel has to be in the church. Certainly, they, uh, uh, the word of God has to be central in the church. But then the discipleship ministry, where Christians are encouraged and they, they're growing as a result of their interaction with this book. talks about baptism. It talks about teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And it talks about the truth that Jesus is with us presently. He says, and I am with you always, even on to the end of the world. Amen. We need to not lose focus of the central mission that he's called us to. That would be Satan's desire today. Jesus said he's coming again. Satan knows the hour is coming. He knows what this book says. He knows what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that he trembles. The devil believes and trembles at the Lord and his voice and the truth. Jesus says there's going to be these signs, and we see them happening in the world today. So what ought that to do for the Christian? How ought we to respond? Faithfulness, a heart that's dedicated, surrender to the Lord, a burden to win the lost, share the gospel, so they too might come to know Jesus. But knowing that he's coming again, what a hope and what an anticipation and what a joy it brings our hearts. One day he's going to call us out of this world that is so cursed and so sorrowful, and he's going to call us onto himself, onto that place he's gone to prepare. And so when Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. He speaks of the signs of his coming. The apostle Paul warns Timothy, yes, times will grow worse prior to his coming. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up, Jesus said, for your redemption draweth nigh. I'm so glad we could meet in this way, and we've been holding these services outside, and uh, our service, as we've been focusing in on the life of Christ, the great purpose of his coming, the great purpose of his crucifixion, the great purpose of his resurrection, the great purpose of his ascension, but then the great purpose that he is coming again. And we praise the Lord for that. And I trust you know Christ is your Savior, and I trust you're encouraged with the truth that Jesus is coming. And he could even come today. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The scripture ends. The Bible ends in that way. And so we rejoice in that truth today as we bow our heads in the closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for what the Bible teaches us concerning your return. We thank you for the warning that you're giving the whole world. Thank you for the privilege of taking the light and going out into this dark world and being a light for Jesus. We pray that many would come to Jesus today, find eternal life, find that well springing up into everlasting life. Lord, we pray for those that are going through times of difficulty. Maybe some that are here, they're not saved. Maybe some that are here and they're going through one burden or another in their life. We pray by the Spirit of God you would speak to each heart.
Father, we don't know the day or the hour. We thank you. you. You don't want us to know the day or the hour. But you have given us these warning signs from your word. And we pray we'd be diligent. We pray that we would be faithful. We pray that we would be encouraged in the day we're living. Yes, we know that we are living in difficult days, but you're with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. We have the promises of your word to claim through difficult days and hours. We pray, Father, that you would take what has been spoken and use it for your glory this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your songbooks and we're going to close our service today with hymn number 542. And this is our invitation hymn this morning. And so it may be you're here and you need to ask the Lord Jesus into your heart. And you can respond just where you are. Maybe it's something else that is burdening your soul. And you can respond just as you are. And we just trust that the Lord would speak to each heart here as we close our service with number 542. Lord, I'm coming home. I've wandered far away from God, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I trod, Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open now thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. Let's just bow our heads as Katie plays to a verse of that hymn. This is an opportunity to respond to the leading of the Lord in our hearts this morning.